So, systematic theology is taking what is there, the timeless truth, and applying it. Now, the other thing Kolb does a good job with is he, he does a really good job of making things relevant. And I can say that because I think it's true, and also it helps because he's a colleague of mine. And if you haven't figured that out yet, Dr. Kolb is on faculty here, and you'll probably run, in, run into him on occasion as well. He spends about half of his year running around in Europe doing mission stuff and teaching over there, and he usually comes back here about winter quarter and spends four quarters here at winter and spring, and then he's off and running around again. So he'll come and go. So that's who you're reading about. So he's a real person you'll get to meet. He's pretty relevant. And one of the things he does is he talks about the fact that we all come to any work or any kind of thought with presuppositions. And this is a, maybe a hard thing to swallow, but it's very, very true. And this comes out of, quite honestly, postmodernism. Now, postmodernism is what? You guys, I'm assuming, have done a little bit of scholarly work and academic reading. So what is postmodernism? Yep. I'm sorry, go ahead. No absolute truth. OK, what's right for you might not be right for me. OK. So no absolutes. What else comes underneath this? Situationalism. Situationalism. OK. I'll put it up here. <coughs> Situationalism. I like chalk better than whiteboard, by the way, but I'll do my best. All right, what else? Postmodernism. Bad or good? Depends on the situation. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> now, most of you probably were taught it's pretty bad. And that's how usually it gets spun. The bad thing. Postmodernism. Relativism. No absolutes. Free for all. Anybody does what he wants to do. Everybody just grabs for his own truth. But the fact of the matter is, postmodernism has some good things to it. And postmodernism really is just a description of kind of the latest wave in thinking in the world today. And it obviously implies that before postmodernism was modernism. And it helps just a little bit to talk through some of this stuff. And you're thinking, this has nothing to do with theology. But actually, it has a lot because we have to get to our current situation and know where things are fitting. And what we have is kind of our three periods. You have what is known as the pre-modern period. And then you have modernism. And then you have what is being passed off as postmodernism, which some people would argue is simply modernism taking a new form and trying to disguise itself. I'm sometimes suspicious that's what's really going on. But you have these three sorts of categories. Premodernism describes the world up to about the time of Descartes, Rene Descartes, sometime in the mid 16th century, okay, shortly after Luther. You start having this corner being turned into the kind of period of modernism really picks up steam in the 17th century, the 1600s, and of course reaches full flower in the 18th century, the 1700s, when you've got our country being founded on the principles of modernism. But that's another topic for another time. So, pre-modern is the idea that you have God, you have authority, you have the way things are, and then we sort things out and learn about this world because God teaches us. And you're counting on things like revelation, and you're believing in things like absolute truth, and you believe that God, the creator, is the key part of this. That's kind of some of the aspects of pre-modern world. Modernism also believes in absolutes. Modernism believes that somewhere there is just this truth that is there, and we can discover it. But modernism relies, rather than on revelation, and by the way, what do we mean by revelation? Truth yeah, truth revealed, God showing something to us. In other words, this is not something you just figure out. It's got to be shown to you. That's what we mean by revelation. Modernism believes there is this absolute truth, but man gains it. Man learns it. Man discovers it by himself. And he does this a couple of different ways. Man can gain knowledge into this absolute truth simply by thinking. And this is known as rationalism. And it takes on all kinds of forms. One of those forms that shows up a lot is called idealism. And that was really popular on the European continent in the 18th century, in the 19th century. So idealism. And idealism is this concept that um, if we think the right things, we will be able to r arrive at the way things really are. Rationalism. Any of you guys do um, Greek philosophy, study the classic Greek philosophers? Anybody? 
Thank you for patronizing me. Okay. Well, it was 30 years ago. Yeah, a long time ago. All right. You guys know who Plato is? Okay, who is Plato? Greek philosopher. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Good. Anybody else know anything else about Plato? Was Aristotle his two uh, Okay, guy. you got the other big name here. Aristotle's the other good guy, or the big guy. All right. There's a whole bunch of them. There were a whole bunch of Greek philosophers. You got Heraclitus and all kinds of these guys. And, you know, there's a bunch of them. Now, it gets frustrating, to be honest, because so much of theology is dealing with philosophy. You say, I don't care about philosophy. And some of you maybe even were raised in this kind of attitude. Philosophy is man trying to learn things. Who cares? It's of the devil. Just give me pure theology. I'm going to try to undo that as well. Because philosophy is man trying to come to terms with this world. And a lot of what he's doing has some value. Is he ever going to get it all right? No. But his efforts often define how people are thinking in the world. And so when the church... Theology is trying to be relevant to the culture. Guess what we do? We interact with that philosophical world. We interact with what's going on there. And often we will translate what we're talking about into terms they understand. This happens all the time. Not a bad thing. It's called being relevant. And so you've got to know your culture. And that's why you've got to know some of your philosophy. And I know it seems like a trip down memory lane. Who cares? But you've got to know a little bit about some of these guys. Plato essentially falls into what we would call the rationalist camp. He had this sort of idea. Plato was a philosopher who lived, and I'll get my dates right, I'm going to say roughly 500 B.C. I remember right. might have been in the 400s, okay? And so Plato was a long time ago. Plato was a great thinker, but he really thought that you would arrive at the way things are primarily by thinking. And so you don't have to be looking around and look, watching stuff. You would just think things through and you come to logical kinds of conclusions. Logic is really running the show here. What makes sense? What describes the way things really are? And that's probably enough on Plato at this point. The other way of learning about the world is the way most of us do it. How do you know things? How do you learn things about the world around you? Them. Experience them. Observe them. Study them. That's known as empiricism. Empiricism. Empiricism is when you try to look at what's going on, study it, the scientific method. Do studies, do experiments, figure things out, come to conclusions, and you say, that's what we've got here. This is the truth. That's the empirical method. This is the scientific method. Observation. And the Greek philosopher who was known for this is primarily Aristotle. Unlike his teacher, because Plato was Aristotle's teacher, and if you want to put this into context, Socrates was the teacher of Plato. So you've got Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, kind of how the order goes, all right? And Socrates didn't write anything down. Anything we know about Socrates is through the pen of Plato. So Plato was more of an idealist rationalist, pure thought. Aristotle came along and said, you know, let's not get hung up on this ideal. Let's look at what we, we really got in the world. So he studied the world, <coughs> and he studied science. And he was interested in doing ta taxonomy, like just trying to describe plants and animals. He did all kinds of stuff like that. And people think, oh, he's just a boring philosopher. He was really into his science. And he studied stuff, the way they were, how things interacted. He was an empiricist. Modernism essentially kind of recaptured this ideal that man can figure things out. And one of the Greek um, mantras or Greek um, axioms was man is the measure of all things. Man is the measure of all things. He can figure things out. Man decides, man determines, man studies. He comes up with truth. That's what modernism was about. But see, modernism, like the pre-modern world, believed there really was an absolute truth. Maybe even thought he might want to call it God, but didn't really think you needed God to do this kind of a thing. Who needs God? And a classic example of this would be the deists of our own country, guys like Thomas Jefferson, that louse of a church of a country father. Okay, Thomas Jefferson, who believed, who needs God? We just do it our own way. His God was the one that he liked. And modernism then sorted this thing out according to man being the measure, looking for the absolute, convinced that somewhere there is this ultimate truth. 
examples. Christians, you've got your understanding. Muslims, you have your understanding. Buddhists, you have underst- your understanding. But ultimately, you know what? All the same God. All the same truth. Just different expressions of that one ultimate truth. That's modernism. That's the idea of modernism. Postmodernism said, you know what? Modernism has been trying for a couple hundred years to figure out the ultimate truth and try to fix the world's problems. They've failed. Hasn't worked. It's come up empty. All we've got to show for their efforts are a whole bunch of world wars, a lot of people dead, and nuclear weapons. Not a good heritage. So we're done with it. So postmoderns say, instead of trying to find this one big, ultimate, absolute truth, we're going to say what really matters are individual communities. And what matters is the faith systems that individuals develop. And truth exists, but it's not an ultimate truth. It is truth within a community and according to the standards of a community. That's sort of what postmodernism is about. Postmodernism wants to take into account how a community functions. And it's not so quick to simply judge it as being irrelevant or not true. It's true if it brings about a valid way of living for the people within that community. That's how postmodernism works. And this gets a lot more complicated, and we don't need to get into all that. But one of the other things that postmodernism gives us is it says we have to realize that these communities shape how we think. They shape us. They shape how we think. They influence dramatically our worldview. And so because of this reality, a guy who grows up in India, in a caste system, is going to have quite a different view of the world than a guy who grows up in modern America of a free-for-all, autonomous society. It's a different way of looking at life. And they're shaped by that. So this is what some of the, one of the things that postmodernism gives us. When you think about this whole thing, where do you fit? Good LCMS Lutheran, I would assume probably spent a few years there. Maybe you even grew up LCMS and are deeply imbibed in the truths of Lutheranism. Are you a good postmodernist, good modernist, or a pre-modernist? Come clean. What do you think? Post? I think most of you are pre-moderns running around. That's what I think. Because most of you probably believe the Bible is God's word and that's it. And you'll take it at truth face face value. And you don't take it you don't question it. It's the Bible. It's the absolute truth. And you tend to believe Luther was right on just about everything. And you're willing to believe that there is an absolute truth and God makes it clear. The fact of the matter is, good LCMS Lutherans have sort of lived in a little vacuum as the world has cranked by them and taken our shots and complained about a lot of stuff. But as the world went through its modern phase, we were just hanging on to our pre-modern worldview. And as the world now slides back into, post- into post-modernism, we're still over here hanging to our pre-modern worldview. The amazing thing is this. In a pre-modern world, we're suddenly relevant again. Because in a modern world, we're seen as passe and outdated and hopelessly hanging on to the past. Now, we're seen as people who are a legitimate, viable community who have a take on life that works. And so people now are paying attention to us again. It's kind of fun. And it's kind of cool. So postmodernism has its downside, no doubt. No absolutes. Yeah, that's a problem. The situationalism, yeah. See, I'm not willing to completely buy that. Because within a community, it's not a free-for-all. All kinds of rules. All kinds of standards. You've got to do things the way you've got to do them. And see, even... An inner city gang has a community with a whole bunch of rules and a whole bunch of way things have got to be. You better do it, and it shapes how you look at things. You see, that's what, and that's the reality. Postmodernism is helping us realize that, helping us see the truth of that. So we are pretty much pre-moderns running around. We're also, though, greatly influenced by our culture in ways more than we realize and want to admit. The idea of the tolerance and accepting lots of other ideas, that's crept into a lot of our thinking. We've got to come clean with that. But we essentially kind of function over here. I saw a hand a minute ago. So, question me? Yeah, it's just, it seems to me as though no matter where you come down in in terms of your own personal uh, uh, perceptions, 
that postmodernism would be a useful tool for thinking about other people in their situation yes. and relating to them. Yes, I agree. That is, that's very true. Another very beneficial thing about postmodernism, as I've been stressing, is it, it kind of says whatever, if you're coming from a certain perspective, it's legitimate. We need to pay attention to you. And so like a Roman Catholic kind of a worldview is suddenly relevant again. And you're even, you, if you pay attention, you're picking up on this, even in the press. The media and stuff are starting to pay a little more attention to what's kind of going on in Rome. It's not quite as, you know, poo-pooed as it used to be. It seems a little more relevant. Why? Because you've got how many hundreds of millions following this faith and saying it's relevant. And so now people are saying, well, maybe we need to pay attention to it. What's going on here? So that's, that is one of the strengths. One of the other really helpful things about postmodernism is it makes us come clean about presuppositions. And that's what started this whole lecture up here, all right, is this word right here, presuppositions. You've got them. I've got them. And presuppositions occupy all of our heads and all of our thinking. Everybody's got them. One of the myths of modernism is the myth of the objective thinker. Now, you might have already covered some of this in Old Testament and New Testament. I don't know. I don't know how much you were just kind of cranking through the facts and how much you were doing fun and games stuff, all right? Here we do fun and games stuff, all right? We just don't crank through the facts. Objective thinker. How many of you can sit down and read the Bible objectively. None of you can. Not one of you. There is no such thing as just a pure objective reading of the Bible. It doesn't exist. Because everybody, when they sit down to read the Bible, has presuppositions coming in. Everybody. They might say to themselves, this is a holy book. And you treat it with reverence. That's going to shape how they read. They might say to themselves, this is a nice collection of fables, kind of like the Enuma Elish that's about it, and we'll just read it for the fun of it, see what we can glean out of it. It's going to affect how they read. They might say to themselves, this is an old book with great wisdom, and I'm going to gain from this wisdom. It's going to color how they read it. They might come into it saying, this book reveals God's plan of salvation for all of eternity. It's going to shape how they read. You see? And there is no such thing as somebody who is purely objective. This is true also with theology. A lot of Christians have this notion that, you know, if we're all just reading the Bible, we should all have the same truths. There shouldn't be these silly doctrinal differences. We should all just get along. And, you know, really, Lutherans and Presbyterians and Methodists, ah, come on, we're really all the same. We're all believing the same stuff. We're just arguing about little piddly stuff, and it really doesn't make any difference. Let's just read the Bible, and we'll get it right. How many of you have ever sat down with a Baptist and tried to prove to them infant baptism? You go to your strongest Bible verse and you say, there it is. Baptism now saves you. Boom. Done. Got it. And they look at you and say, yeah, well, that means baptism saves you when you're trusting in it appropriately as you should. And when you do it in the right way, all right, maybe it saves you that way. And they don't, they're unconvinced. Ever experienced that? Or the frustration of trying to convince a Presbyterian of the real presence of Christ in the, in the sacrament of Holy Communion? He's really there in the bread and wine. His body and blood are really present. Why? Jesus says, this is my body. Done. And they look at you and say, <laughs> no way. His means that. But you know, Jesus obviously is talking in a simile matter here. This is a metaphor. You're interpreting it incorrectly. And you get nowhere. You say, no, well, what's going on? Come on. Just be an honest reader. His means is. You say, no, no, you're being a bad reader. You're not doing it right. See, the problem is the presuppositions going in. Everybody's got them. Everybody. And so this myth or this illusion that we're just going to be an objective reader here. We're going to come up with the real facts here. And any reasonable person who sits down and reads it will conclude as we conclude. This is simply not true. The reality is we have presuppositions coming in. And so we need to be honest about some of those and admit them. We're Lutheran. We have Lutheran presuppositions. There are reasons for them. Some of the reasons for those are as simple as you're part of the community, and the community has told you that's how it works. And that's it. Other, we got other reasons, though, too. We would say there are 
logical reasons for what we do. And we have empirical evidence for some of the things we do. And that stuff matters to a point. But see, ultimately, a big question whenever it comes to interpreting scripture or understanding theology is, what are your presuppositions and why are they there? What are your presuppositions going in? And you will gain a ton of um, headway in discussions with other people when you start thinking about the presuppositions that they have. And ask yourself, what are they assuming? What are they accepting as truth? And how is that coloring how they think about everything else? So we as Lutherans want to be upfront about our, our presuppositions and what some of those are. So one of our presuppositions is that God exists. He's there. And that God has chosen to reveal himself and make himself known. He does that. He shows us how he operates, and he, con he shows us how he's operating in this world with us. We assume that. That's a presupposition that we have. And we're going to talk about some more of those here as we go. Questions at this point? Okay. Our quick overview of Western thinking in the last 500 years. And actually, you could take this framework and plug just about everybody into it somewhere or another. It would probably come off pretty well. But that's not the point of this course. We'll save that for another time. How did Martin Luther define God? 